been playing the fiddle and leading singing and discussions about Pa Ingalls in libraries and historic sites all across Michigan since 2004, so he's been at this for a while. Um, one of his favorite venues is in fact our log cabin, where we used to celebrate Laura Ingalls Wilder's birthday, although I don't think we've done that recently. Um, when not playing Pa Ingalls, Glenn leads historical dancing in elementary schools and leads traditional dancing for homeschoolers and their parents all across the United States, and he and his wife Judy, who is a renowned dulcimer player, live in Highland, Michigan. So, without further ado, I give you Glenn Morningstar. Thank you very much. Can you hear this okay? It's going to be a good. It's going to be a combination of acoustic and this special thing here hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> Does anyone know the name of that tune? <laughs> Do you know where the name comes from? <laughs> if you look at the words of the song, it's a clue as to where the phrase comes from, Pop Goes the Weasel. Do you know? And um, the pop is actually the phrase used for opening uh, a device that holds your money. So when you pop goes the weasel, the pop is a button. And the weasel was a weasel. The weasels were used to make belts. And the belts uh, that they made would have a pocket on them for your money. And a button to keep it closed. So if you were buying something and walked into a store, you would pop your button and pull out your money. A penny for a spool of thread, another for a needle. And that's the way the money goes. Pop goes the weasel. We should sing it. <laughs> I'm not sure that all of you can see it, but the, maybe enough of you that you could help me out with this. as well. Not only did people sing it, they danced to it. This was common in many of these old tunes. So. All around the flowers and the monkey chased the weasel. The monkey thought it was all in fun. And so I should read a little something from one of these about that particular song. Uh, this is uh, from about 1880, well, she was five years old, so it'll be 1872. Here's something from 1872, can you imagine? And it talks about uh, when Pa came in for breakfast and it was Laura's birthday. Her fifth birthday. So here's what he says. That morning when I came to breakfast, I caught Laura and said she must uh, have her spanking. First he explained that today was her birthday and she would not grow properly next year until she had a spanking. <laughs> and then he spanked her so gently, carefully, 
that it did not hurt. One, two, three, four, five, he counted and spanked slowly. One spank for each year, and the last one big spank to grow on. Then Pa gave her a little wooden man he had whittled out of a stick to be company for Charlotte. Charlotte was her doll. Ma gave her five little cakes, one for each year that Laura had lived with her and Pa. And Mary, that was her older sister by two years, gave her a new dress for Charlotte the doll. Mary had made the dress herself, and when Laura thought the, that uh, Mary was sewing this patchwork for a quilt, it was actually for Charlotte the doll. And that night, for a special birthday treat, Pa played Pop Goes the Weasel for Laura. He sat with Laura and Mary close against his knees while he played. Now watch, he said. Watch, and maybe you can see the weasel pop out this time. Then he sang, a penny for a spool of thread, another for a needle. That's the way the money goes. Laura and Mary bent close, watching, for they knew now was the time. Pop, said Pa's fingers on the string, goes the weasel. But Laura and Mary hadn't seen Pa's finger. Make the string pop. Oh, please do it again, they begged him. Pa's blue eyes laughed, and the fiddle went on while he sang. All around the cobbler's bench, the monkey chased the weasel. The preacher kissed the cobbler's wife. Pop goes the weasel. <laughs> they hadn't seen Pa's finger that time either. He was so quick, they could never catch him. So they went laughing to bed and lay listening to Pa and the fiddle singing. This uh, collection from Laura Ingalls Wilder is a treasure, as you all probably know. Well, here's a little history of uh, the Ingalls family and them landing at Pepin, Wisconsin, which is where they were uh, at the time. And the um, family had originally uh, settled up in the Alleghenies. That's where uh, Charles Engel was born, was up in New York. And they moved to Illinois in 1842, then on to Concord, Wisconsin in 1850. And it was there that uh, Charles Engel met uh, uh, Caroline Quiner. And she was from Concord as well. Uh, they married and they moved to Pepin, Wisconsin, which was a popular spot. They moved back and forth to there because they had gone west and, uh, in fact, outside the boundaries of the, the United States into Indian Territory and were moved back because of the threat of retaliation, rightfully so. And uh, they uh, were in the Pepin area when Congress passed the Homestead Act which affected many states, particularly the ones being settled in 1862, uh, Michigan included. And you could get 160 acres for the price of settling it and improving it. And then it was yours if you stayed five years. So they, they did that. And uh, in particular, tried selling the property, and, or fell at least it, mortgaged it when they moved west, and, but then came back again. Uh, I make that point because uh, they, were hurt, they were sturdy people, hearty people. And you can tell by how they built the cabins and if you read any of the books about the fireplaces that were built and how they were put together and the dangers, you know, every day between the house burning down and the wolves at the door. <laughs> it was a tough place. And this is back in the days of bears and wolves and, and things that uh, made it tough to keep livestock and you always had to be on guard. And who was, who was on guard at the uh, Ingalls house? Jack. Jack the, Jack the dog. <laughs> and uh, don't you love those stories that tie family members to their animals that uh, guard them? And if you, look at the, if you look at the fences from those days, they were split rail laid uh, like uh, Z's. We, and, uh, uh, very important, and there's tons of stories about what happens to those um, fences. Um, let's visit the time after they returned to Pepin. They'd been out to the west, and they'd come back to Pepin. And um, let me just read a little something for you here, them having come back.
as far as a man could go in one day to the north, or a week, or a month, there was nothing but woods. This is the big woods. There were no houses, there were no roads, there were no people. There were only trees and the wild animals who had their homes among them. Wolves li lived in the big woods, bears and huge wild cats. Muskrats and mink and otter lived by the streams. Foxes had dens in the hills and deer roamed everywhere. To the east of the little log house and to the west there were miles upon miles of trees and only a few little logs scattered far apart in the edge of the big woods. So far as the little girl could see, there was only the one little house where she lived with her father and mother, her sister Mary, and her baby sister Carrie. A wagon track ran before the house, turning and twisting out of sight into the woods where the wild animals lived, but the little girl did not know where it went nor what might be at the end of it. This was Laura. She called her father Pa and her mother Ma. In those days in that place, children didn't say father and mother, nor mama and papa. It was Ma and Pa. At night when Laura lay awake in the trundle, she listened and could not, and could not hear anything at all but the sound of the trees. Sometimes far away in the night, a wolf howled, then he came nearer and howled again. It was a scary sound. Laura knew that wolves would eat little girls. But she was safe inside the solid log walls. Her father's gun hung over the door and good old Jack, the brindle bulldog, lay on guard before it. Her father would say, go to sleep, Laura. Jack won't let the wolves in. So Laura snuggled under the covers of the trundle bed, close beside Mary, went to sleep. One night, her father picked her up out of bed and carried her to the window so that she might see the wolves. Imagine that. There were two of them sitting in front of the house. They looked like shaggy dogs. They pointed their noses at the big bright moon and howled. Jack paced up and down before the door, growling. The hair stood up upon his back and he showed his sharp, fierce teeth to the wolves. They howled, but they could not get in. The winters on the prairie were both harsh and fun. Most of the foodstuffs were put up in the winter, just before winter in the fall when you could freeze things, or uh, if you wanted to salt them, if you had the proper materials to salt them, or put them in the ground, keep them in the ground and dig them up when you could. Uh, the uh, families obviously didn't work as hard in the winter because there were no trees to be cut other than those that they could haul, and obviously no, no crops. Uh, so that was their time of the year to uh, go out for entertainment. And if you think back then, uh, how would they travel during the winter? How would they travel to a neighbor's house? How would they travel? Sleds and sleighs. Of course, uh, the cutter was a popular sleigh. It was the two-person sleigh. And be it one horse, typically with a cutter, or multiple horses with a sleigh, sleigh or a sled, uh, there was always competition about who had the best sleigh or the best sled or the best cutter or the best horse. And of course, uh, there'd often be races, be they with the cutter or without, and some of the races were quite impromptu uh, and to see who is the best of the best. And often it was in places of congregating, like at a church. So you would often see uh, rivals try to get to the church first. And, uh, of course, it, in some cases, might not be thought as church-like to race, <laughs> race past the church, but it happened. Um, and what kind of entertainment would they enjoy in the winter at the larger homes? Dances, of course, dances in big houses. And Pa Ingalls, not only did he play the fiddle, but he's also a dance caller. 
So he would play and call the dances. And people generally back then, uh, there weren't that many dances going around, so they would know the dances pretty much. And of course, the younger people were learning from those who were veterans of the dances. So I was thinking of a dance that uh, Pa would uh, lead, and here's one uh, to a tune you're familiar with. And um, we'll play it first and sing a little bit of the dance as he would have, and then um, we'll all sing it together. But uh, see if you know this tune. <laughs> Center six hands around. All join hands in a circle to the left, circle to the left, circle to the left. All join hands in a circle to the left until you get back home. Now everybody join to the middle and back. Make your feet go wickety whack into the middle and back again. Face your partner for a right and left grand. Hand over hand around you go, around you go, around you go. Hand over hand around you go and then promenade your partner home. Little Buffalo Gal. <laughs> well, we should sing this. <laughs> Buffalo Gals, won't you come out tonight? <laughs> now, my favorite verse is this one right here in the middle, so let's make sure we sing that with clarity. <laughs> We'll sing a verse and a chorus, and I'll play a little interlude on the on the fiddle, and then we'll come back and sing the next verse and the chorus, and I'll play a little interlude in there, and then we'll sing that last verse all together again. So let's do the first verse. As I went lumbering down the street. <laughs> As I went lumbering down the street, down the street, down the street, lovely girl. Angles would call the square dances, and of course he'd, he'd uh, call the uh, reels as well. So his repertoire was quite broad. Um, the uh, tunes, of course, would be the popular tunes of the day, and people would make up moves or take moves of the day and put them to those tunes. Uh, speaking of dances, uh, let's uh, let's let's hear about these dances. There was a special uh, relative of uh, of Paz that was. Now, popular at these dances for uh, uh, one important reason. And here's the family getting ready to go up to cramp Grandpa's uh, to uh, gather there for a dance. Uh, and it's on a Monday morning. 
So it's Monday morning, everybody got up early in a hurry to get started to grandpa's. Pa wanted to be there to help with the work of gathering and boiling the sap. Ma would help grandma and the ants make good things to eat for all the people who were coming to the dance. Breakfast was eaten, of course this was while well, still dark, and the dishes washed into beds made by lamplight. Pa packed his fiddle carefully in his box and put it in the big sled that was already waiting at the gate. So there was uh, five of them getting ready to travel in this big sled. The air was cold and frosty and the light was gray when Laura and Mary and Ma with baby Carrie were tucked in snug and warm under the robes on the straw in the bottom of the sled. Now doesn't that sound like a cozy spot? <laughs> the horses shook their heads and pranced, making the sleigh bells ring merrily. And the way they went on the road through the big woods to Grandpa's. After a while, there was sunshine in the woods and the air sparkled. Now, just imagine how that would feel back then. Uh, that would feel, yeah. The long streaks of yellow light lay between the shadows of the tree trunks and the snow was colored faintly pink. All the shadows were thin and blue and every little curve of snow drifts and every little track in the snow had a shadow. Did not seem long until they were sweeping into the clearing at Grandpa's house. All the sleigh bells jingling. Grandma came to the door and stood there smiling, calling them to come in. She said that Grandpa and Uncle George were already at work out in the maple woods, so Pa went to help them, while Laura and Mary and Ma, with baby Carrie in her arms, went into Grandma's house and took off their wraps. Laura loved Grandma's house. It was much larger than their house at home. There was one great big room, of course you know what they did there, and then there was a little room that belonged to Uncle George, and there was another room for the aunts, Aunt Dosha and Aunt Ruby, and then there was the kitchen with the big cook stove. At supper time, Pa and Grandpa came from the woods, each had on his shoulders a wooden yoke that Grandpa had made that was cut to fit around their necks and hollowed out to fit over their shoulders. From each end hung a chain with a hook, and on each hook hung a big wooden bucket full of hot maple syrup. Now these yokes were not a, a, a tool only of the 1800s. They survived well into the 1900s. Pa and Grandpa had brought the syrup from the big kettle in the woods. They steadied the buckets with their hands, but the weight from the yokes was on their shoulders. Uncle George was home from the army. He wore his blue army coat with the brass buttons. And he had bold, merry blue eyes. He was big and broad and he walked with a swagger. Laura looked at him all the time she was eating her hasty pudding, which uh, George had put maple syrup on from his little, his little bucket. George is wild since he came back from the war, Pa said, <laughs> shaking his head as if he were sorry, but he couldn't be helped. Uh, Uncle George had run away to be a drummer boy in the army. And this was the Civil War, of course. When he was 14 years old, Laura had never seen a wild man before. <laughs> she did not know whether she was afraid of Uncle George or not. When supper was over, Uncle George went outside the door and blew his army bugle long and loud. It made a lovely ringing sound far away through the big woods. And it's an interesting tradition if you go to any of the libraries and even the reenactments today, before dances were played, typically a bugle or a trumpet announces the dances. It's still done today. Listen, Uncle George said, isn't that pretty? He heard the echo come back across the big woods. Well, here's another dance in a, a song of the period. Of course, Stephen Foster's work was fresh on everybody's mind. It's in there somewhere.
one of the other forms of dance that Paul called for, called for were the old reels. Of course, a Virginia reel was a generic term. There were a lot of reels from Virginia, the trench mower, hunt the fox, uh, Sir Roger D. Coverly, there were many. And uh, so here's a reel, and uh, here's Paul calling this old reel. Long lines join hands, go forward and back. Do it again, go forward and back. Right elbow. And back with the left. Face the music, counter march. Uh, find your partner, lead him home. First couple, gallop down. Lines join hands, go forward and back. And that would be the dance repeated again and again. Do you recognize the tune? <laughs> Camp Town Races. Again, uh, the popular tunes of the day, not unlike centuries later, would be the basis for many of the dances that they did. And people could associate the tune and the steps, the marching, if you will, when to step with the dance. So that was a real, so we should sing Camp Town Races. So someone was betting their money on the bobtail mare, and somebody was betting on the grape. And I'm sure there was more betting than just on those two. <laughs> See them flying in a 10 mile heat. Wow. Round the track, then repeat. Went down south with my hat caved in. Come back north with a pocket full of tin. Of course, what would the tin be? Money, of course. So here's Cat Town Races. Let's sing it together. We'll sing the first verse and then we'll sing a chorus and we'll have that little interlude after the chorus. Here we go. Camp Town Ladies. so much today that an instrument in the household in the 1800s was quite rare and and also a dance with many musicians was quite rare typically just a fiddle and often our harmonica or harp uh, was the other or a pump organ if it was in the house and that tradition still holds today too you can go to events where you see just a fiddle and a pump organ playing and um, anyone here ever play a pump organ of uh, the old style with that you really have to pump it it's uh, it's no small feat <laughs> but <laughs> so so a musical instrument uh, was rare as was the ability to sing uh, together. And what's so nice about this collection from Laura 
Ingalls Wilder is she talks about her and Almanzo as they were courting and one of the things that they did was to go to a singing school. And uh, the old shape note singing back then, of course, was provided to give people a sense of relative pitch. So if you were playing a scale on an instrument like the fiddle, you would hear the same scale used in preparation for the singing, fa, sol, la, fa. And then people would get their pitch from that, and they would have four parts, sometimes three if the altos were uh, not particularly liked during that season. But uh, three parts for sure. And uh, the four parts would each be written so that they were their own melody. You could sing a bass line and shape note, and still do it today, that it's its own melody. It's a wonderful melody, as is the, the, the tenor line and the alto line and the soprano line. The, so the, the instruments meant a great deal, again, because of the entertainment they provided, but were quite unique. And of course, before any other forms of uh, entertainment besides dancing and singing, this was very special. So uh, people ask, what's the difference between the fiddle and the violin? And uh, the instrument is the same. It's the very same instrument, but it's played uh, differently. And uh, the violinists have such a smooth and uh, juicy style where a fiddler is kind of rough and rowdy to be heard. Uh, the fiddles would typically be set uh, this bridge right here would be set high, so it's louder, but when you do that, you sacrifice the smoothness, and then violins set a bit lower, so it's sweet, and uh, of course used in orchestras, big orchestras. Well, let's journey to the prairie. Let's journey to the prairie. And um, what is a prairie? Does a prairie have a lawn? Does it have trees? No. Well, sometimes, sometimes. <coughs> ah, the trees would be at the rivers, yeah. And uh, particularly if you uh, notice some of the prairies that are being reconstructed these days, uh, what do you find in the prairies primarily? Grasses, blue stem, long blue stem, short blue stem, tall blue stem. Um, and uh, if we went across the prairie, in the Kansas, uh, we would see primarily tall grasses. And uh, you know, if you saw trees, it was a signal. Water, water was there. But imagine the prairies back then. And today when you find a good prairie, what it uh, harbors, rabbits, pheasants, you know, uh, all, all living things, and the th things they feed on as well. So uh, imagine driving along the prairie and all of these birds flying up and the animals running around. And, and so it's quite exciting for a while. Here's Kansas, again, in the 1880s, you know, late 1800s. Kansas was an endless flat land covered with tall grass blowing in the wind. Day after day they traveled in Kansas and saw nothing but the rippling grass and enormous sky. In a perfect circle, the sky curved down to the level land and the wagon was in the circle's exact middle. All the day long, Pet and Patty went forward, trotting and walking and trotting again, but they couldn't get out of the middle of the circle. When the sun went down, the circle was still around them and the edge of the sky was pink. Then slowly the land became black. The wind made a lonely sound in the grass. The campfire was small and lost in so much space. The large stars hung from the sky glittering so near that Laura felt she could almost touch them. Next day the land was the same. Now here's where it starts. To <laughs> yes. Sky was the same, the circle did not change. Laura and Mary were tired of them all. There was nothing new to do and nothing new to look at. The bed was made in the back of the wagon and neatly covered with a gray blanket. 
Laura and Mary sat on it. The canvas sides of the wagon top were rolled up and tied so that the prairie wind blew in. Has anyone here seen a prairie schooner? The old Conestogas? Uh, wonderful invention. Uh, land and water. Land and water. The, it, the wind whipped Laura's straight brown hair and Mary's golden curls every which way, and the strong light screwed up their eyelids. Um, so think of, you know, a uh, hundred and some years later, 130 years later. Oh, wow, Mary yawned, and Laura said, Ma, can't we get out and run behind the wagon? My legs are tired. Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, Laura, Ma said. Aren't we going to camp pretty soon? Laura asked. It seemed such a long time since noon when they had eaten their lunch sitting on the clean grass in the shade of the wagon. Pa answered, not yet. It's too early to camp now. I want to camp now. <laughs> I'm so tired, Laura said. Then Ma said, Laura? That was all, but it meant that Laura must not complain. So she did not complain any more out loud. <laughs> but she was still naughty inside. She thought, <laughs> I like this line, she sat and thought complaints to herself. <laughs> now there's a lesson for life, I tell you. Her legs ached and the wind wouldn't stop blowing her hair. The grass waved and the wagon jolted and nothing else happened for a long time. We're coming to a creek or a river, Pa said. Girls, can you see those trees ahead? Laura stood up and held to one of the wagon bows. Far ahead she saw a low dark smudge. That's trees, Pa said. You can tell by the shape of the shadows. In this country, trees mean water. That's where we'll camp tonight. Well, a song that reminds us of a long journey is uh, one that they sang at the campfires. And we should all sing this one together, too. from Alabama, my banjo on my knee. Of course, uh, in the Civil War, where was Alabama? South. It was part of the South. So this was a, this was a, a song from Alabama that was very popular, both North and South. And it was a bit of a, a jest of a song, a bit of a jest of a song. Rained all the night the day I left, the weather it was dry. Yeah. Sung so hot, the sun so hot, I froze to that. <laughs> Susanna, don't you cry? Let's sing this one too. Oh, again, we've got a verse and we've got a chorus, and I'll put that little interlude after the chorus. And we'll sing the next verse. Mm -hmm.
Well, here's the ghost of uh, Pie Angels. Well, I'm right proud of my daughter, Laura, what with her being so quick and smart. Here it is, 1884, and her earning her second grade teaching certificate. See, she's teaching right out here on uh, Old Man Perry's claim. Only a bit from our claim. And they're calling it Perry School. With her money, a whopping $25 a month, Laura's planning on buying an organ for Mary so she can play it. At this point, uh, when Laura starts school, um, do you remember what had happened to Mary? She was blind. She was blind. And uh, so she was returning from the College of the Blind, and they wanted to have an organ for her when she returned so she could play it. So uh, Laura was indeed going to spend her money from teaching. It was just a couple of three months, three months. And then Pa and my Engels were going to pitch in the other 25 because there was an organ for sale uh, in town. And uh, they recognized that they would, re they would take a $25 down payment and they could bring the organ home and then Laura's money could pay for the rest of it. Well, here's the song that they sang the night that they celebrated all these achievements by, by Laura. And uh, if you look at the account of the test for being able to receive the second grade certificate, it was all questions written on a chalkboard. And they were answered in essay form. So we should sing a song to celebrate the same song they sang that night. <laughs> Uh, songs that uh, we're doing today and quite a number more uh, we're so fortunate that someone went through the books of Laura Ingalls Wilder and put this together 
the songbook, the Laurel, Laura Ingalls Wilder songbook. So they're collected and it shows what book they came from, it gives them music. So if you're working with schools at all and you want to give them a great gift, why, uh, this is a great gift to give a school, I think, right here. The um, Conestoga wagon uh, was one of the greatest inventions for, for taping microphones back then. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you had families that used the Conestoga wagon, either from uh, across the United States or from the United States up into Canada? You had to cross the Niagara River. And uh, again, it floated, so it was its own uh, raft at the same time that it uh, was a, a tent, a tent on wheels that floated. Now imagine that. Uh, and the big wheels, of course, needed maintenance, and we were always breaking down, and axles needed to be fixed, and spindles got broken, and things like that. But uh, Pa Ingalls, along with the people of the day, were very industrious. And uh, so these things could be mended, and particularly parts were taken along, spoke shaves and things like that. So if you ran out of spindles, you go out in the woods and you find a tree and, you know, basically cut it down. And with the spoke shave, you could cut your own spindles. Uh, something I wanted to share with you. And imagine, um, even to this day, obituaries when they're written uh, don't always make it into the local papers. But here's one I think you'd be interested in. A pioneer gone. The people of DeSmet were pained Sunday afternoon to learn of the death of Mr. C.P. Ingalls. That was Pi Ingalls, Charles B. Ingalls, who died at 3 p.m. of that day after a lingering illness of several weeks. Heart trouble was the cause of his death. Funeral services were held at the Congregational Church Tuesday forenoon, largely attended by the many friends of the deceased and of the family. After the church services were concluded, the Masonic fraternity, who were in attendance in a body, took charge of the funeral and the remains were placed in their last resting place with the solemn funeral rites of that organization. Charles P. Ingalls was born in the state of New York 60 years ago. Again, of that period of time, 60 was a long and prosperous life. His life was that of a pioneer from his boyhood. At the age of 12 years, he moved with his parents to Illinois, thence a few years later to Wisconsin, and then to Minnesota. It was while living in Wisconsin that he married the estimable, estimable lady who is now his widow. In 1879, he brought his family to what is now Dismet. He was the first to build a dwelling in this locality. And uh, they talk about staking claims. Of course, that was the claim to the 160 acres that uh, was part of the Homestead Act. Um, the house that now stands on the rear end of the bank of DeSmet lot is the building. In his home were held the first religious services. He was prominent in the work of organizing the Congregational Church in the city, which he was a faithful and consistent member at the time of his death. He was also a member in good standing of the Masonic Order and of the OES. As a citizen, he was held in high esteem, being honest and upright in his dealings and association with his fellows. As a friend and neighbor, he was always kind and courteous, and as a husband and father, he was faithful and loving. And what better can be said of any man? Uh, there's more, but it, it follows that same thread. I read that only because of what uh, properties he and values he held uh, important to him were obviously instilled in his family. And uh, for uh, Laura to write these many chapter and verse of that time is quite remarkable. In a, a real piece of history, so many tunes come out of that period. One that we're familiar with is called, um, it was so long ago I might forget, uh, Punch and Floor. And punch and floors are described in, in the Little House books. 
Are you familiar with punch and floors? Uh, of course, the cabins were dirt floors to begin with, but then they would take logs and split them right in half the long way, and then put the flat side up, and then channel out the dirt in the cabins to lay the logs round side down, flat side up. And that was a punch in floor, punch in floor. So these pieces of history are captured in these books. Say, um, we should all sing one more song together. It'd be a song that you'd hear if they were going to church or to some uh, great gathering. So we should sing that here as a great gathering. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for organizing this great event these Thursdays, teas at two, and uh, for inviting this group, a nice large group, with many red hats, I noticed, <laughs> here today. And to Lorraine Campbell and the whole staff here at uh, Troy, Historical Village, Troy Historic Village continued success. So let's see, we should sing, we should sing this. Wait for the way. So um, does anyone recognize all braided up with dahlias? You know what dahlias are? Good. Hollyhocks, you know what hollyhocks are? So imagine dahlias and hollyhocks being in the hair in the braids of these young girls. Maybe something. Big hand. 